On this Byron Lazine podcast, I get to sit down with Ryan Pineda. Eric, the broke agent, jumps in. We had spent the whole day with Ryan in Las Vegas, going to his private golf club, checking out his office. Ryan has hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers, over a million on TikTok. He's flipped hundreds of homes, over a hundred in just the last 12 months. Ryan also owns hundreds of real estate rental property. He's been in the game since 2010. He adds a ton of value to any entrepreneur looking at real estate in multiple different directions. He just brought his over 150 plus agent team or independent brokerage rather into real. Ryan really has figured out how to scale his business. If you want to scale your business, make sure you hit the link below and try Sisu. Sisu is where real estate transacts online. If you're a single agent, agents that use Sisu increase their volume by 28% and teams and independent brokers that are on Sisu increase it by over 107%. I own the number one team in the state of Connecticut. We operate everything off of Sisu. You should be using Sisu. Hit the link below to try it and enjoy the Ryan Pineda podcast. Here we go. We've got Ryan Pineda on the podcast. Ryan flips, what are you, uh, over 100 homes a year? Yeah, right around 100, yep. Super knowledgeable real estate investor. He's got future flippers. He's got a bunch of different companies. We're going to get into as many of them as we can. I want to really pick your brain on investments and house flipping. Okay. Uh, of, of course, Eric's sitting on the Yeah, why on am I here then? All right, there's the two words Eric will say <laughs> in, in broke agent fashion, but... Ryan, just you know, quickly your background, how you got into investing in real estate at such scale. Yeah, man. Well, first off, thanks for saying my name right because I butchered yeah. your name on mine. That's so all right. I appreciate that. But uh, no, I started back in 2015 um, flipping houses. I was a realtor in 2010 and I hated doing that like the broke agent. And I, I realized that flipping houses was cool because you didn't have to like go represent a buyer or a seller. Like you were the buyer. Yeah. You were the seller when you wanted to sell. So it made things easy. And I eventually um, maxed out my credit cards to buy my first flip, um, used hard money loans, you know, I had 12% interest rate on it, uh, used all my credit to buy, use the down payment, and thankfully uh, found a deal, ended up working out, made 25 grand that first deal. And there's a whole bunch that went into that, but you know, the quick story is um, after doing that, the rest was history. Um, That's big risk when you don't have anything. It's yeah. easier to take that back against the wall risk like you had nothing when you were starting off or did you guys have a little money or you know using yeah. a credit card to make your down payment is risky yeah someone would, would think yeah so i would guess for a lot of your audience they're like that's not even possible right. um because they think you have to get an fha loan or something but you know with hard money they don't really care like they just really care about that's right are you buying a good deal or not um because they're making 12 percent off you <laughs> so yeah. you know uh I would say for me, I had saved up 10 grand. I was about 25 years old, which for me was a lot of money. But in the grand scheme of things, I knew that I had to take a risk. Like 10 grand is not going to make me retire or, you know, put me to the next level. So I need to just bet it and see what happens. Um, and I do see a lot of people who follow me, you know, have a lot of fear to do something like that. They'll be like, oh man, like it's so risky doing this. And I'm like, you're 22 years old. You can recover. I mean, yeah. I, I shared on your podcast, I went bankrupt at basically that age from the mortgage crisis, Yeah, right? L little, you know, a couple of years older than 22. Uh, but you can recover really quickly, even if you go through that, the worst thing of all time. I mean, literally six months later, I had a credit card again from going bankrupt. Yeah, and that's my this point. Is, this is America. If they give you a second chance. If you're literally in your 20s, especially if you have no kids and, and no family, like, you have literally no risk in life. <laughs> like, yeah. take all the risk you can. Max out car credit cards. Like, do something to pursue a dream. I don't care what it is. Um, don't follow Dave Ramsey. Just like well, take a risk. Some of <laughs> Dave's stuff's pretty good, but uh, I'm not. Not if you're 20. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with you in in terms of investing in real estate. You know, you, you should be using debt. I don't believe you're probably you're probably not paying 12 percent now at the scale of your app. But in the beginning, you might have been paying 12 percent on hard money. But I can't imagine. If you're um, taking hard money now, you're at 12. We we use a blend. So, I mean, like right now, we've got 60 flips going on here in Vegas. And so we've got some hard money lenders who are like 8%. We've got some of our original private lenders who have been at 12 since the beginning. And I still can continue to pay them 12 just out of loyalty. Wow. You know, because they've 
I wouldn't be where I'm at if they didn't take a chance on me early on. That's interesting. I would have thought you would have been like, okay, what's the lowest in the market? Eight. I'm just doing eight. No, because like I said, these people have helped me get to where I'm at. And actually a lot of these people are now investing in my fund to buy apartments as well. So like, um, we've made a lot of money together. And so there's no, I mean, like when you look at it at the end of the day on a flip, it's like the difference between eight and 12% over the span of four months it takes to flip a house. <laughs> it might cost me an extra thousand bucks. Like mm -hmm. it's not a big deal. Well, you, you absolutely love helping people. You helped Eric and I on the golf course a whole bunch helped, today. Helped me lose $200. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what you helped with. <laughs> Help, helped me on course management. Right. But you love helping people and, you know, shows and everything that you're doing, but you didn't enjoy being an actual real estate agent, which yeah, that's basically the whole mission is helping people. So what didn't you like about the agent side where every, everything else you're doing, you're helping? Yeah. Um, I think I don't like working for people. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like I don't, I've never had a job like in terms of, yeah, this was my boss and I went into work every day and he told me what I had to do that day. Like everything I've ever done, I've had the choice to do it, you know? And basically I, I didn't mention this, but I played pro baseball. So I got drafted by the Oakland A's. That was literally the only job I ever had where they're like, be at the field, do this. But I loved it. That's baseball. Yeah. But being a realtor was a bit different because um, first off, I had to go hunt for clients and go prospect and find these people. Then they're basically my boss. Like I can try and sell them a home, but if they don't want to buy it, whatever. Um, and so I just didn't like that feeling. And, and even today, like I don't have a boss. And even in all of my businesses, we have clients, we have students, but like they don't tell me what to do. You know, I just don't like that feeling. Um, I would say, though, the, the point of where I realized I didn't want to be a realtor was back in 2010 um, when I first got started. I was 21 years old and um, we had just gone through this um, recession. Right. And we were just kind of nobody knew it yet, but starting to finally come out. And they had houses here in Vegas. We got hit harder than any other um, city yes, in the U.S. 100 percent. There were houses that were built in 2008 that were selling for 350 grand and I was showing them for a hundred grand, like unbelievable. You could not build you, a house. You knew they were a deal. Well, I was 21. I'd never seen the market. I'm like, I don't, it seems like if I could go buy a sick new house. You for, can't, you can't build it for what they're selling. It yeah. For. I'm like, I, I think it's a good deal. Right. And so I go show this to um, this guy and, you know, I'm like, what do you want to offer on it? We could probably even get it for less. Like, just like, let's offer like 80 grand. That's what I was telling him. And um, he looks at, it, he's like, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, I I think the market's going to keep going down. And I'm like, to what? What do we, is it going to be free? Like, <laughs> how, are they going to pay you to house. take these homes? Yeah, I don't, what What do you, this house was 350000 two years ago. <laughs> how, how, how much less is it going to be? Well, well, people that don't invest in real estate, they always think it's going to go lower. It's always yeah. going to go lower and, and then they just miss out. Eric, we're, did you feel the same way uh, as Ryan? About when like having a boss? No, 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 not when you were investing in real estate. When, when before you <laughs> started the broke did. agent, when you were a real estate agent, mm -hmm. did you feel that way where it's like I don't like answering to people, or did you not like the prospecting? What was it for you? Most of my deals came from my friends, and I think the fact that it reversed my friendship to, mm. you know, a professional interaction, I think that really changed how I looked at everything. So I had my buddies that I would you know drink with, hang out with, golf with. And it elevated our conversation to something that was very serious. Yeah. And I think that caused a lot of anxiety for us and put a lot of strain on a bunch of friendships. All the deals ended up completely fine. But I think that's where a lot of your first deals come from as a real estate agent. And that's what I really didn't like about it. How, how do you feel about business with friends? Um, I actually love it. Um, but it's because it's reversed. Like mm -hmm. they all work for me. Yep. So many of my friends are employees in my companies and um, they love it. Like they know that. They have the opportunity to make a lot of money. Like I have a pretty great culture in here. You guys have seen like people have fun. We yeah. work hard. It's a young environment. Like it's really cool. Um, they're all handcuffed out there, but other than that, yeah. no, <laughs> you know, they're all slaving away. No, they, no, you can tell it. It's I mean, a young vibe behind the glass over there. <laughs> it, 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 we can attest. It's a young vibe. Really cool thing yeah. you're building here. Yeah. So, you know, now I love it. Um, and I, honestly, the first people I try to hire are people I already know because I know their character. I know what they're all about. Um, I'd rather hire someone I know versus some random person I just met from LinkedIn. Right. Like, yeah. So I don't have a problem with it, but, um, 
Eric might have a different perspective than me because I started in 2010 where that same house is now worth $400,000 today. And I would have to sell that house four times to make the same commission today. Right. And also too, you had mentioned you went bankrupt from all that. Literally like everyone was bankrupt in 2010. Yeah. Nobody could get a loan because they all lost their jobs. They had bad credit. Um, there was no listings to even get in Vegas because 80 to 90% were REOs. Mm -hmm. And so nobody had equity. You either, you either had the REO contract as an agent yeah. or you, or you didn't. didn't. Yeah. And I, I didn't. And so trying to get a client back then was like the hardest thing ever. And, you know, I, I talk about it today, like being a buyer's agent is rough, but if you do get an offer accepted, you're making good money. Um, but it was way harder in 2010. And that kind of made me not like the industry. Yeah. It's hard now, but for much different reasons, but the price points are great. So when you do close deals and the top agents are closing deals, like yeah. even if it, you got to write the contract seven times before you get the deal, yep. the, the really good ones are doing deals. Where, where do you see the market going? And this is a hard question, obviously, because, you know, everybody in the TikTok comments is saying any day now it's just going to completely implode, right? Yeah. But where do you actually see the housing market going in terms of inventory and pricing? Yeah, I mean, man, these these eighteen year olds on TikTok buying all these houses. Yeah, like they're giving some good advice in the yeah. comments. <laughs> That's where I get all my information. <laughs> yeah, from, like so. I don't read Inman or Bam yeah. or anything. Like I just read the TikTok comments because yeah. it's the best source <laughs> of info. <laughs> so. Uh, Go, no. to, go to BAM, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah don't go to the TikTok comments. <laughs> Just watch the video. Right. So, yeah, I think, you know, for the next, at least this year, I've been saying it forever, um, the market's going to keep doing what it's doing. Um, I think rates are rising a little bit right now. Um, I still believe, I've said this from the beginning of the year, that rates were going to rise in, you know, this March, April time, because they've yeah. been talking about that. And I think they're going to drop them again. I think that... They're going to use some excuse, and that excuse is looking like Russia to lower rates and print money to go fight a war and do this stuff. And I think we're just kind of stuck in that cycle where we have to lower rates to keep things moving along. Because if we raise rates, the economy will crash. Like the people who in the comments, they are not wrong. Yeah. But everyone knows that that's kind of the predicament we're in. And so nobody, Biden ain't going to do that. <laughs> So you no, just trying to get reelected. You just don't believe the Fed when they say they're going to come out and, and continue to raise these rates. I do not believe them now. I believe I believe them in that they are going to do it initially, and then they're going to retract yeah. and change their mind. And there'll be some story of why. Of course. Yeah. That's the media. I just yeah. care how it affects crypto. Anything yeah, that happens, it has nothing problem. to do with crypto. Yeah, actually, it does. <laughs> anytime they say, D does gonna, it? I don't know. You you it, guys are more knowledgeable yeah, on it than I. Anytime there's a Fed meeting or something. I watch all these crypto YouTubers who are all yeah. hacks also. Um, <laughs> not also. You, they, make good they make good AdSense though. Well, you know, they, they give me nice price predictions that I like to, that I like to see. But anytime there's like a Fed meeting or something like that where they say rates are going to rise. Yeah. Crypto yeah. crashes. Well, why does crypto crash when there's less buying you, you would think it's the opposite though. Wouldn't you think that people, more people would want crypto if like the interest rate was, yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think it's the opposite, Ryan? You would think that, but um, markets are irrational. Yeah. Like, that's just what it is. And um, when you actually think about, like, that'd be a very smart person thinking that way. Uh, retail is not smart. <laughs> like, they're, they're fear-based. They're news-based. Everybody wants to be a day trader in everything they do. Yeah. And so when you hear, oh, oh crap, they're about to raise rates. Bad things are going to happen. Everyone pulls their money out of crypto. Um, and it's actually, if you can pull it out before and then buy in again, like then cool, you bought the dip. But uh, I don't know, with with my crypto stuff, I'm buying a lot of NFTs and stuff. I don't day trade, like I just buy and I just chill. Yeah. Well, everybody wants a quick buck. That's why I'm so impressed with what you've done in real estate investing because that's the furthest thing from a quick buck. Yep. People hear house flipping and say, oh no, I can make, you know, you know, 25% of my money in four months. Or, you know, you said you yeah. flip a house in four months. Why is house flipping not a short-term game and it actually is a long-term game? Um, so for me, when I first started flipping houses, um, I had no, you know, I guess, uh, desire to buy rentals, mainly because I was broke. I needed to just get as much cash as possible. And the thing with house flipping is, you know, it's like you never get 
cash rich because you're always throwing it into the next flip and the next deal. Reinvesting. Yeah. It's not like a normal business where you make cash and then it's there. You don't really need to go invest it again. So, um, I did that for years. I just constantly kept credit cards maxed out because I needed money to do a deal. Were you living off of that money too? Yeah. 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 House flipping was the only way I made money. Yeah. So it was your income and your reinvestment into the next deal. So you had to have both. Yep. And so I looked at my house flipping business as that like a business, like, Hey, if I invest into this business, it's going to keep growing and we can do more deals. I can hire more people. And that's a better long-term play than buying a rental property, just sitting on it and like making 200 bucks a month. So I kind of looked at it like I got to build this long-term brand that's going to constantly make me money. And, you know, I was telling you guys at lunch, um, we're about to have our first million dollar month with house flipping and wholesaling. So, um, I can tell you, I personally have not like done any of those deals. Yeah. You know, I'm chilling with you guys on the golf course and filming podcasts and, you know, um, that's what happens when you invest in a business and allow it to do what it's supposed to do. How do you start flipping homes? It's not with a hammer, right? So how do you start? <laughs> um, yeah, I've never swung a hammer. I just uh, still don't even know how to do half the things um, yeah. that these guys do. Because you can't scale that way. No, you can't scale um, doing that. It's the same way as an agent. You can't scale if you're just a buyer's agent all day. Like you're going to hit a cap for how many houses you can actually show, right? You're going to eventually have a team yeah. that does all the work for you and you can just get good at generating leads. Um, so house flipping is the same way. Um, now granted when you're first starting out, just like when you're a realtor, you have to get in the trenches and do stuff. Like I do believe you should be cold calling and learning skills and sales and all that stuff. There's no shortcut to all the things you have to do to become very good at sales or prospecting or marketing and stuff. You know, if you're going to start posting on social media, your first posts are going to suck. <laughs> it just takes time to figure out your voice and not if you're the broke agent. My, my first post definitely sucked. <laughs> they were not good. We need to make a meme of his yeah. first post. We, we gotta my see first it. logo was an image of a dilapidated house. It, and that's all it was. His first <laughs> post was, was, Byron, will you email me back? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, it, all those things have to happen in order to create the success later on. And so I think um, if you're looking to start flipping houses, um, like shameless plug, I would just go get a mentor off the bat had I did it again, you know? So we do that at Future Flipper. Future like, Flipper. Yeah, I would just join the right mentor right out the gate because <sighs> trying to figure it out on your own with anything is really hard. Yep. You know, if you want to be a realtor, get like with the best guy. I don't care if they take half your commission or even more, get with them, learn yeah. from them and you're going to fast track it. And everybody who's actually done it says that same thing. It was the mistake I made. That's why I went bankrupt during the mortgage crisis. I just went out there and was like, loans are free. Ooh, <laughs> let me go try this. Let me go take all the risks, but never got around anyone who did it. Didn't even seek the advice. Was just really stupid about how I was doing it. And then I figured out, okay, I got to get around some people that are doing what I want to do at a really high level. Well, and the other thing I'll add too is, um, you know, back in 2010, there was, well, there was YouTube, but it wasn't <laughs> what it is today, right? Yeah. Podcasts were not this big thing. No, you're right. So self-development's come a long way. Self-development has come a long way, but I think it's actually hurt a lot of people as well. Because sure. one of the big things you see is like people are like, oh, well, I could just watch YouTube. I can yeah. listen to podcasts. And it's like, you still don't do anything. Right. You got to take the action after the, the yeah. podcast is over. Like you are exponentially more likely to, you know, have success having an actual mentor or coaching program yeah. with you, not YouTube university. Right. Well, I love podcasts because I can listen to a podcast every single day while I'm in the gym and, you know, be learning and figuring out something new or whatever. And you don't have to sit there all day and absorb this content. You can do it when you're in the car in the gym, but then go actually take the action to do the work. Yeah. I've been listening to a lot of golf podcasts lately. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. No yeah. wonder. He has, he has the baby draw going out there on the They're golf like, course. This is how you do it. No, the how does that translate? The like course listening? management stuff that I was talking okay. to you about was like strategy, right? Yeah. Like mechanically, it'd be hard to learn from a podcast. You That's gotta, what I'm, you got to visually see it. See it. Yeah. But the strategy and how to get over the mental game, the nerves, the... I could use that for sure. Yeah, Eric, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the good podcast. You have yeah, a sand yeah. trap podcast? It's not, sw <laughs> it's not swing as hard as you possibly can and then no. see what happens. Yeah, the mental game is for sure. Like, What else do you, what, a guy like Ryan Pineda, what else do you listen to? 
Um, I love podcasts just like you guys do. So kind of whatever it is I'm into at that moment. So I think back in 2020, I like, so what I'll do is I'll only listen to one podcast. Like that's it. Cause I don't want to listen to like five different things. Yeah. Um, so I'll figure out what is it I need to learn. So in 2020 when crypto was going nuts and the stock market had just tanked to the bottom, I was like, I need to understand crypto and stock market. So I started listening to a podcast called, um, the investors podcast really great. Um, and I listened to that for a year straight and it was, it taught me a lot about that. Um, in 2021, I think it was more of the same of those guys. I continued to listen to them. Um, and then as I got into golf, I just was like, I'm all in on golf. I want to listen to those podcasts. But, um, when I was first starting in real estate, all I did was listen to bigger pockets. That was it. I didn't yeah. try to learn about e-com. And you weren't listening to Dave Ramsey. You mentioned that earlier. I'm definitely not listening to, you know, my guy, Dave, but, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, there's so much that that's the other problem is with today's age, there's so much information that people get confused because they'll be like, right. oh, well, Byron said Dave Ramsey is good, but Ryan said Dave Ramsey sucks. And like, yeah. they're like, who do I believe? Well, there's certain things about, let's get into the Dave Ramsey stuff. There's certain things I would agree with you because I already know w which way you're leaning on that, where you've used leverage, you've used debt to yeah. build your business. And, and I believe in that. Absolute, right? You, you can't wait until you've got cash to go buy your first house or to buy your first investment property. You're going to be waiting. You would have got killed life. these last couple it, of years. You would have never gotten in. You would have never gotten the upside of an appreciating market. But there are certain things that I really believe in. Like there is bad debt out there. I don't have car loans. Right? Yeah. I buy cars cash, right? Mm -hmm. And so why have a car loan that you know is going to be bad debt? If you do want to go out and get a mortgage, if you do want to go out and invest in real estate if you obviously have the cash to to just buy your car outright but i would argue that his advice to most people isn't buying you know a brand new tesla it's going out and buying you know some type of beater yeah. cash don't have a payment when you're trying to build i love that advice it's practical yeah and i i agree with that um i grew up very frugally you know i had become a millionaire and i was still driving a ten thousand dollar car that i had bought like i I lived way below my my means for a long time. Um, the only problem I have beyond just the leverage aspect, because I think you should always leverage real estate. It's just, yeah. it's so cheap. Of course. The debt. Like, Even if you can put cash on it, just yeah. put a 3%, 4% now interest rate on yeah, it. Yeah. Like it, it just, it doesn't mathematically make sense to yeah. not leverage it. Um, and I used to only buy my cars cash too. Um, but like, you know, the Porsche that we we drove in. I decided to finance it because it's a really expensive car. And I was like, well, you know, I bought this thing for 160 grand. And I'm like, if I put 160 grand down on this, which I have, um, that gives me less that I can go use towards a flip or something else. And the interest rate on this is 4%. So it's just like, now I look at it as a mathematical thing of like, man, I definitely know I can do more with this. You have a lot of cash coming in every single month. If somebody was starting like you did in 2010, they shouldn't buy a Porsche. Leasing or buying a Porsche, <laughs> you know, or, yeah. or really any car payment, right? The average car payment, Dave Ramsey talks about it all the time, is like somewhere around $500 a month. That's insane if you're trying to build yeah. a business and you're starting from totally zero. Totally agree with that. Like when I was just starting out, um, I bought my $10,000 car cash. Yeah, um, that's what I'm talking about. And we about. had another one that we bought for $10,000 for my wife. I didn't have the cash, but I mean, obviously she needed a car. And so our payment was like $200. Did, like, you, did you put a payment on the Porsche just because you have so much cash coming in every month? Well, it's just like now I have so much debt and liability from all these businesses anyway. Like, I mean, we, it's what, all what the, the heck's business. a car, right? Just throw well, it Well, yeah. There. Like if we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every month, maybe over a million between all of them, like between paying contractors and employees and marketing and just all the stuff we do, what's a $3,000 car payment? It's nothing. Does the debt keep you up at night at all? No, people have asked me that. Um, you just kind of like Cardone talks a lot about this. Like you, you get used to it. Like, you know, I have $20 million out in hard money loans right now for flips. Um, with my fund, we, we've bought in the last five months, 460 units. And so I forget what the debt is on that, but it's over 20. It's million. a lot. Yeah. It's over 20 million as well. And so it's just like, am I going to not sleep at night? Cause we go from 50 million to a hundred. Like it's the same. There's not. Like I'm all in at this point for everything. Like, you know, if I were to just be like, I'm going debt free, uh, my house flipping business wouldn't work. 
right? Like, I don't have 20 million cash. I'm not that rich. Like, you can't just go and keep flipping. The business would die. Yeah. Um, with the fund, every fund uses leverage to buy things. So it's like, you just understand that debt's actually a good thing when it comes to real estate. Now, I agree there's bad debt um, with the cars. Like, nobody should buy a Porsche. Yeah. Like, if you- Nobody should go out and get a student loan. Yeah, Unless no. you know you're going to be a doctor. Yeah, or I, I totally agree with those bad debt. You shouldn't be using credit cards to finance a lifestyle that you can't afford to live. Like, yes. 100%. Um, the only problem I have with Dave is just the risk that um, he, like, just how risk averse he is. Yes. Like, it's very anti-entrepreneurial. You'll be really old by the time you can enjoy all that money if you follow that part of his advice. So so I'm, I'm on the same page as you are w- with Dave Ramsey. You brought up Grant Cardone. Eric and I were talking about earlier, uh, you having Grant on your podcast, yeah, you know, interviewing Grant, what was your experience with Cardone? Um, dude, I like Cardone, man. I know a lot of people, um, you know, hate on him and all this stuff, but that means you're kind of doing something right. If you got, you can't be everything to everyone. You should have haters and people who love you. Um, but my first experience with Cardone was back when I just got started flipping houses. I heard him on the bigger pockets podcast back in 2015. I was like, this guy's kind of cool. Like he's like, out there, he was unlike any other guest they had. He was just saying crazy stuff. He, he is a soundbite machine. Yeah, I was like, this guy is cool. And um, sure enough, three years later, um, I got to attend 10X here in Las Vegas in 2018. What did you that, pay for the ticket? So um, I actually was sitting in the second row, and I would never have bought this ticket. It was like a $10,000 ticket. And um, one of my contractors goes, hey, I have an extra ticket. Um, do you want to go? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like, okay. And that event literally changed my life. Um, not that Grant said anything mind-blowing, but it was the first time I'd ever been around other entrepreneurs that were ultra successful mm. in things outside of real estate as well. You know, I got to hear Russell Brunson speak for the first time. That literally influenced me to write my first book and to create a course. I wasn't even on my radar, but he inspired me to do it. Um, <laughs> I saw Ty Lopez for the first time. And never heard of Ty Lopez in my life. Um, and everyone's You're like, "You're in my garage." Yeah, I never. I, I had no idea of YouTube ads. Oh yeah, dominated YouTube yeah. ads. Yeah, for two years. Yeah, for sixteen, sure. seventeen, he was everywhere. Right, and so you know, I had no idea who this guy was, but what he was saying on stage made complete sense about YouTube ads and everything else. I was like, "Wow, I never even knew that." And um, you know, later I learned all these guys like there's people who hate them, then there are people who love them, and I just was like, "Look." I can learn something from everyone, regardless of if they're a good person, a bad person, a freaking uh, whatever you want to call them. I just was like, I can learn something from these guys. And I did. And it pushed me to do things I otherwise wasn't on the path to do. So um, as far as Cardone goes, I I really appreciate the guy because he's influenced me to do a lot of things I've done, especially with starting a fund, like watching what he's done. I mean, his fund has bought $4 billion worth of assets. Like... (laughs) That's what you do with influence in the real estate space. You start a fund because that, I, I don't know, I could sell a lot of courses and I could flip a lot of houses, but nothing's going to get me close to $4 billion like a fund. Um, and But, you know, as far as the podcast goes, he was really good. Um, I was actually really surprised with our interview because usually on other podcasts I've seen him on, he's super combative. He's like always in it. And I had a lot of people say after, like, dude, that was like the most tame I've ever seen him. He was like chill and was like it, I forget, was it virtual or in person? It was virtual. Virtual, yeah. Um, and they were like, he was chill, like he was respectful and like it was weird. And I was like, Yeah, it was weird. And he even had done research on me. Like I hadn't told him this, but he was like, Yeah, Ryan, you got um true books, right? You got a tax company and um that's a real business. Like you're not like these internet gurus who just sell stuff they don't do. He's like, you have a real business. You could save me money on taxes. And I was like, I am taking that sound bite. And that's our next ad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you'll run that for the next 12 months. Yeah. Cardone endorses true books, but it was like, I didn't tell him about that. Like he had known I had this tax company. So, um, I was surprised. Yeah. He and the Wolf of Wall Street really got into it on that podcast. That one definitely they were went viral. At each other's throats for an hour and a half. Yeah. Where it just seemed like everything that the Wolf said, he was attacking. <laughs> well, like, that's yeah. That's cool. He, he wasn't like that on yours. Yeah. yeah. He was, uh, 
picking apart every question yeah. or not answering the questions because yeah. I did actually, I saw it trending and I was like, oh, let me go check out what the heck's going on here. Meet Kevin did a great breakdown of that. Actually, entire. that's where I think I saw yeah. Meet Kevin. You, you've met Meet Kevin. Yeah, Meet Kevin and I have done some stuff here in Vegas. Uh, we filmed at uh, some of my properties. I you, think he's brilliant. Yeah, you love Meet Kevin. I love Meet You're Kevin. You're always talking about Meet Kevin. Kevin is, um, he's like extremely smart. Um, brilliant he's guy. quirky. He's got his own, you know, he, you know, he dyed his Genius. hair. He, he's like, yeah, I mean, I, he's all over the place. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, what's with the hair dye? I, I, Some, I, sometimes you have purple hair. What's, is that like a branding thing or a fashion thing? Well, you know, what's funny is like, so Kevin ended up doing it after me. Yeah. And first I just was like, one day I was like, dude, I'm just going to dye my hair blue. Like everyone knows me for my hair. And I'm like, what would happen if I dyed it blue? Like, let's, to your point of what we talked about on my podcast with Instagram, like, let's test it. Let's see if we get more views and everything oh, else. Oh, wow. And so I tested What's it. the clicks? It was the click. And honestly, I just like wanted to do it. I was yeah, bored. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, all right, let's try red. And so I did it red. And then I'm like, let's try silver. I did silver. And then the silver turned into blonde. And I actually kind of liked the the blonde look. It made me feel like a, a super saiyan a little bit. And so <laughs> it was cool. It's a Dragon Ball Z reference. Well, I, I knew it was, I, thought, I thought it was like a Mortal Kombat type nah, of nah, character. Nah, nah. Did you see nah. an engagement jump? Between the colors? Yeah, what do the analytics say on this? Because <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll dye my hair pink, whatever I got to do to get more whatever it takes. I'll cut my head off if Go I need to. Go with a uh, so, uh, clown yeah. wig. I, initially, um, with blue, people were just shocked. They were like, what the heck did this guy do? And um, I don't think there was much change, right? Then I went to red, and people were like, okay, so like, this is a thing now. Like, okay. And then um, I went to um, blonde, where it was like a normal kind of dye. It wasn't crazy. And... With blonde, I got more engagement. Okay. And um, it could be just that I happened to put out better content that month or whatever. Like, I don't know, but sure, it was better engagement. Yeah. Will so, you go back to it? I think I will dye it at some point. Maybe I'll do money green or something, but. You do have a great hairline. It's like. It's crisp. It's crisp. And then it waves up. It's fantastic. People Thank think you. I dye this. This, uh, this gray right here. My hair's really short today because I just yeah. got a haircut. But there's like this, when it's longer, there's this huge gray streak. They're like, you're dying that yeah, to make the streak. Like, that? That's no, tight, I, though. I like that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not <laughs> dying it. That's yeah. It would be a lot of work because my hair grows so fast and I cut it. My friend Kong, um, you guys seen him on TikTok, a little uh, Asian guy that's just always going crazy. He uh, started, co he, co he literally copies everything I do um, as far as what we do. It's just a running joke. He's like, oh, if Pineda's doing it, it must work, so I'm going to do it. I'm like, dude, half the things, I don't know if they're going to work. I just do them, and, like, <laughs> we see. So he starts dyeing his hair, too. And so, like, he actually had a gray streak, like what you had, but he dyed it. All the way. Yeah. Well, just a streak. Well, you got to keep uh, you got to keep dyeing it because I'm sure you, what do you get your hair cut every, every couple week, weeks? Dude. Every week, yeah. Every so week. The yeah. barber comes to I'm my house weeks. every Monday, like clockwork, because I film on Mondays. I'm like, just cut it before I film, and I'll always Yeah, you got good. the tight fade going. That's, yeah. you know. Uh, shout out to this guy at the Cosmopolitan. Is he, is he your guy, Gucci? Is he your guy here no. in Vegas? No, I got a haircut from Gucci. <laughs> in uh, this is his name in Las Vegas at the Cosmo Barber Shop. It looks good. Yesterday, unbelievable. Yeah, I, I was like Gucci. You got to move to South Florida, man. I, I, need, <laughs> I need you over there. That's funny, uh, dude. Yeah, I didn't know if the, that was the same guy. So, what do you see? In, in you're in Las Vegas. You're investing heavily. Las Vegas, like you said, was crushed during the mortgage crisis is when there will be a downturn in real estate coming, will Las Vegas look much different during the next downturn? Well, okay, let, let's talk about the recession because we kind of glossed over that. Yeah, we um, did. And I know that a lot of listeners are probably super anxious or curious about it. So in Vegas, okay, let, back in 2008 when all this happened, um, a few things were happening. Vegas was building more homes than like almost any city in the nation. So they had all these different things. Uh, you had all these people who could not get loans, but were getting them anyway, buying all these houses in Vegas. And then, you know, pretty much all these houses that were under construction never got finished because the crash happened. So we got hit harder than anyone due to so many of those circumstances. Um, today, do I believe we'll get hit harder than anyone? Um, I don't think so for a few reasons. One, we kind of already saw a mini flash crash with the pandemic, right? Like I remember... Back in 2020, when it happened, um, everyone was saying Vegas is about to get killed because nobody can travel. The Strip's going to die. Like there was pictures of the Strip as a ghost town. Those would have been good memes back then. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, we had high unemployment, like one of the highest in the country. But I was like, I think this is fake. Like I think not COVID's fake, but like the 
recession. I think this is just like a little blip and it's going to go back. And that ended up being correct. And thankfully I kept buying while everyone else didn't. And we made a lot of money. But as we go into this new phase, there's a lot of different things happening that make me think Vegas is going to be more insulated this time. So one is um, people can actually afford the houses they're buying. Like people's still hard to get a loan. Like no, you ain't just getting these free loans anymore. One out of four deals are cash. Yeah. So one, people can afford it with whether loans or cash. Um, two, so many people from Cali are moving here. Like it's insane. The amount of LA people you would know like that want to live in Vegas. And there's just this huge influx of like bigger money coming into town. Uh, the luxury market's insane right now because a Cali person who had a two, $3 million home, that's like not that great comes to Vegas and they're like, dude, I can buy like the sickest home ever. Um, but the third reason, and I think this is what's changing it for literally everywhere, but Vegas included is that you now have hedge funds. And back in 2008, there were no hedge funds. They came in in 2010. They scooped up all those houses, Blackstone, these guys, they made billions, um, buying when nobody else did. And Basically, what's happened since is hedge funds never invested in single family. It was not an asset class, but now it is. And yeah. as we know, if you're a buyer trying to buy a house, you're not competing against other mom and pop buyers. You're competing against hedge funds trying to buy that same house. You're competing against the I buyers trying to buy that same house. And so if I look at all of the houses these hedge funds have purchased in the last couple of years, they're sitting on them. Like yeah. They have no intention to sell it. They have no intention to bring that inventory to the table. That inventory is not going to get foreclosed on. Um, no. That inventory is totally gone from the supply. And the clip they're buying them at just keeps increasing. It's 26% year to date of yeah. deals are investors. It's not all hedge funds. It's, it's investors like yourself. Yeah. But it's 26% of the deals are I literally investors. have hedge funds who buy our flips. Like they're buying, they're paying more than everyone. Wow. And so if you know that these hedge funds are doing this and they're creating their own comps, um, <laughs> I can promise you if things turn, they ain't selling for a lot. Like they're just holding and they're not releasing that inventory to the market. So that's like one of the biggest things that is so different today. And hedge funds are buying in places like Vegas and Arizona and Texas more than any other place in the country. Florida as well. Florida as well, yeah. Because these are the best spots to buy real estate long-term. Um, they're in great climates. The homes are newer. Um, I'd much rather own a home in Vegas than, um, a 1900 home in the Midwest. Like it just, as far as like the house goes, it's way better. Um, so the hedge funds ain't selling, they're taking inventory off the market. But the other thing is because prices have gone up so aggressively, so fast, um, people can't sell. So like, even if you wanted to tap into your equity today, many people aren't selling because they're like, what am I going to buy? I literally can't buy. And so <laughs> it's just this weird thing now where everyone's kind of at a stalemate. Hedge funds taking properties off the table. People who have equity can't sell because they can't buy anything, nor can they even rent anything. There's just not a lot of rentals. And rent keeps going up. Rent I think in 2023, it's going to continue to explode. You're obviously positioning yourself uh, pretty well for that explosion yep. with, with the units that you're buying, but you see the same thing. Rent just keeps yep. going Rent's up. Gonna, rent always lags price. And so yeah. rent is going to catch up. Um, so when you just look at this, you're like, okay, uh, where would a crash come from again? Like how? Yeah. I, I don't know where it would come from. And people thought that it was going to come from all these loans and forbearance, but the, the only place yeah. it can come in this environment right now is if interest rates completely explode and they, and they don't pull back on them. Yep. And that's part of my theory of it. Yeah. I, I don't see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, uh, mm -hmm. I know you guys got to get to this epic ping pong game. Yeah, oh, that's I'm true. Mentally I've, preparing. So that's why I've been sitting here. Eric's been meditating. <laughs> yes. Ryan has uh, former, uh, professional athlete has said he's only lost to one ping ponger in his life. And that person was a professional Eric. So I'm not I worried, Byron. Look at me. I'm I think stoic. you're doomed. I'm stoic. I'm confident. I'm very assured of my ping pong skills. This is going to be a slaughter. 
you look out of your mind worried about this <laughs> It's because I've been sitting in this chair for an hour and a half. I have to pee. I have to use the bathroom. I'm losing my mind. Well, this here. this was not an hour on. and a half podcast. It, it was a short podcast. Oh, you're but right, you're right, yeah. but if you want to go deep on the conversation that the three of us had on Ryan's podcast, we'll link it up. You should definitely check that out. Uh, talk a lot of Instagram stuff. And so, Ryan, really appreciate you coming on my podcast and I want to, I want to do this again at some point Yeah, man. because we'll, we'll have to come out after I beat Eric and ping pong and yeah, you can train. I'll let him train for a little bit and <laughs> redeem himself in golf and ping pong. And I better win this. He, game he just this. needs to bring a fat stack of cash to that, that's right. To be able to pay his yeah. debts yeah. in Vegas. You do a lot of gambling. So even on the golf course, but yeah, Not just Vegas <laughs> really appreciate it. And, um, there's a lot of other stuff I'd love to pick your brain on. So check out Ryan's podcast. We'll link up his stuff below and appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.